Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's nice to see such a nice crowd. I'm Susan James, the Assistant Director here at Bayless and also on the board of the Historical Society. Um, Director Ken Miller was out of town and would have liked to have been here. The Great Michigan Read is presented by the Michigan Humanities Council with support, I'm sorry, there's a lot of language, with support from Meyer and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And on your seat, you probably already found the bookmarks and questionnaires that we ask you um, to fill out and leave at the back when, when the program is completed. Tonight, uh, we have Dee Stevens with us. I'm very pleased to have her here. She's a graduate uh, from LSSU in English. She's published various local history books, including most recently, Then and Now, The Changing Face of Sault Ste. Marie, which is in the back. Uh, she wrote that with Bernie Arbick in 2009. And Sault Ste. Marie, a photo history for Arcadia, Arcadia Publishing's Images of America series in 2008. For years, she was a reporter for the Sioux Evening News. And she has an article on World War II in the most recent issue of Michigan History Magazine. She's a volunteer with the Library and the Historical Society and is on the City's Historic Development Commission. During the summer, she works as a narrator for Sulox Boat Tours. Tonight, her talk will set the national stage for this year's Great Michigan Read. She'll explore local connections to the book. Her talk is titled, Bending the Light, Reflections on Arc of Justice and Race and Ethnic Relations in Chippewa County in the Mid-1920s. Please welcome Dee Stevens. Thank you very much, Susan, and everybody else involved with the uh, presentation tonight. Oops, I'm going to do the same thing Susan did here. I'm going to keep kicking that, I guess. All right. This year's Michigan Read book is about an upwardly mobile black family in Detroit in the fall of 1925 that's trying to find acceptable housing. They struggled with their pasts, the attitudes of their white neighbors, and the politics of the time. Their effort to move into an acceptable house, modest house, not even one that was fancy and deserving of a doctor like Dr. Sweet, resulted in two white people being killed, and Dr. Sweet and eight of his friends and relatives, including his wife and brothers, being arrested and held awaiting trial for a very long time. When Susan James approached me and asked me to talk about what was happening in the Sioux at the same time this was going on in Detroit, I was kind of at a loss. I, what little I knew about the Sioux in Chippewa County led me to believe that it would be like comparing apples to oranges. Nothing like that happened here, right? But I hadn't read the book yet, so I tried to remain open-minded as I did. And when I had finished it, I was outraged at what the community down there had done to those people. I wasn't so naive as to believe, though, that their own decisions hadn't played some part in what had happened. But I still didn't see how that would compare to our northern, mostly white community up here, and what was happening in Detroit. And I wondered if something like that could happen here. People had moved here from other places when jobs were available, but that was a long time before when they were building the locks in the 1850s and 1870s, the first ones, and when Northwestern Leather Company's tannery first opened in about 1900. By 1925, many of our immigrant families had already been here for a generation or two. We had Greek people and Lebanese and Italians and Jewish folks and even there were a number of Chinese people, I think, more than there are around today. And they owned some of our major businesses. We were all immigrants in a way here except maybe the Native Americans, although even they were fairly recent arrivals. They came here having been pushed west by the aggressive Iroquois tribes in the 16th and 17th centuries. Then I wondered, did we even have any black people here in the 1920s? And it turns out there were very few. The 1920 federal census had one family. The dad worked at a wholesale warehouse here. And there were also a few men and women who were maids and housekeepers and did odd jobs around town. And Jim Dwyer just recently found me an article from 1913 in the Newberry News about a black family that was said to be moving to the Manistique Lakes region, region with an out, accompanying outcry of there goes the neighborhood, so that didn't bode very well for how the relations were with black folks. So I don't know whether they even came. But I was still troubled by this, so I started reading papers at the time. They didn't help teaching me anything, really. So I started digging around in the stacks of the library here, trying to find some books about that era. 
Eventually, I did find a few that I think shed some light on the 1920s for me, but uh, they were hard to find. And most of what you hear about at former times in this era seems to be about World War I and then World War II <coughs> and then about the Great Depression. But between World War I and the Great Depression, there was a whole nine years, almost a, a decade that happened. And what was going on during those times? What do you guys know about the 1920s? Let's uh, just throw out some things. If any of you, what do you think of when you think of the 1920s? Just, just throw them out there. Prohibition. Right, that's the first thing I would think of. Yeah. Short skirts and dancing. There you go, hair. flappers. And <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? It's right around that time. Women did get the vote right yeah. around then. It's in my notes somewhere. But, uh, yeah. Was in the 20s, wasn't it? Oh, well, I think 1920 it was. I forgot from the Because Osborne introduced the bill in 1911 when he was governor. Yeah. And it wasn't passed. Yeah, for it seven had to or eight be. Years after. Well, you know, once it was ratified na nationally, I think it was 1920 that it finally. Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody got the vote, but we might have gotten it sooner here. We had like Michigan had it before. That's what right. I figured. We were one of the first before, ones probably. Right before it was nationalized. Yeah. So. <laughs> I guess maybe. Anything else? Or does anybody gangsters? I thought a gangster was an old traffic well. across the river uh, with booze. Right, bootlegging. Yeah, that's another thing I'm thinking about. We'll get to a lot of that stuff here. And of course the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, which is going to be a big part of what happens tonight here. We're going to talk about. Now, um, let me first set the nation here by the st stage if I can, what was going on in the world and the nation at that time. Ernest R. May in the Life History of the United States, Volume 10, 1917 to 1932, did a real nice job of summarizing the 1920s. And he did it so well that I want to quote him at length because it kind of made it easy for me. On the surface, he said, the 1920s were joyous years, Sunday drives, big football weekends, the raccoon coat, the speakeasy, Rudolph Valentino and Clara Bow, Dempsey and Tunney, Babe Ruth and Charles Lindbergh. But this was only one surface. The 1920s were also a time when tens of millions of Americans, black people, rural folk, and intellectuals felt profoundly alienated from the society in which they lived. Looking back on the decade, one can observe that the nation seemed closer to falling apart, not sharply and violently as it did in 1861 with the Civil War, but fissuring and crumbling like one of the great empires of ancient times. Then tragedy struck, that was the Great Depression, and paradoxically made the nation one again. And May says later in the book, another large group of discontented Americans was the farmers, experiencing a sharp agricultural depression. Sharing their unhappiness were the merchants and professional men in the small towns of agricultural regions. Brought up to believe that farms and small towns were the backbone of America, all those people found it galling that the cities, reputedly crawling with foreigners and reeking of corruption, were granted a prosperity denied to them. While their common sense led to campaigns for farm legislation, their emotions found other releases, and we'll talk about those in a little bit here. Everyone hoped that the war, the war would be the biggest and the last that would ever be fought, but a lot of things went unsettled by that World War I. And Germany especially wasn't happy with the deal they got out of it. World War I was pretty much the end of the British Empire, however. Britain, Britain was always, Great Britain was always kind of the, the biggest leader in what happened and ran a lot of the countries. Many new countries were formed as a result of World War I, and no one stepped into the breach as a dominant world force for a while. Germany and Japan almost immediately tried to start filling that gap. All the major trade routes of the past had been disrupted by the war, and also a lot of countries went into debt to us to pay for the war. They were prepared to pay us back, the United States, but they wanted to buy things from us, do it in a trade fashion, and we might have been a little short-sighted, but what we wanted was money, and in particular we wanted gold, because we figured that was uh, the safest form of being paid. But the countries maybe couldn't pay us right away, so we kind of resented that. And uh, we had sent our best and brightest over there to fight the war for them after a while. So what did we get in return? We had lost a whole generation of our young men. In the United States, the war created new groups and classes of people, socially and economically. There was a lot of pushing and pulling and testing of the waters, and things were generally unsettled. There were lots of labor actions and strikes, and people criticized corporations if they got too big and above themselves. 
As I read about the 1920s, I began to realize that there was a great parallel between that period and the 1960s. People cherished their children more after the war, if that's possible, and indulged them in their interests. They spoiled them even, maybe. They let them stay home longer and explore their options, and the kids stepped up to the plate. They felt they were a new generation prepared to do and try anything as long as no one else was hurt by their experimentation. The parents trying to keep their children's love and respect were sometimes at sea. They didn't really understand this new world, so they tried to learn along with their children and to be friends with them, sacrificing the strict parent-child relationship for good and bad. Everything and everyone was new and youthful and vigorous, and that's a charge that's also been leveled at us baby boomers that were denying the inevitability of getting old, so that was another parallel. One of the most well-known facts of the 1920s was legislated prohibition of alcohol. It started as a wartime thing to save the grain so people could make food out of it, could eat it. But after the war, Congress was pressed by the dries or anti-alcohol factions to make that prohibition permanent. Congress said yes, but it also said that the ratification of the law by having it accepted by 36 of the states had to be accomplished in seven years and they figured that was going to be next to impossible and wasn't going to happen. Well, they <coughs> underestimated the wills of the dry folks. They accomplished it in 13 months, and then it was 13 years before we <coughs> had legal alcohol again in the United States. Let's look at what else was going on in the 1920s. Automobiles were being mass marketed and were readily available. Household appliances were being automated. Radios and the movies were bringing the world into our houses. We had more time to get away and explore and more time for leisure activities. Air travel, too, was even becoming more convenient and common. We were following the lives of the stars on the screen and the athletes and making stars of some of them for the first time. More people had telephones and could call each other up at the drop of a hat to make appointments for lunch, for tennis, or for a weekend away. Everything was moving at a dizzying pace. The problem was that, as just in just about any time, there are always haves and have-nots. Those who could not afford to live the hedonistic lifestyle and were watching others do it, even in fiction, on radio dramas, and on the big screen, were bound to resent it a little. In reality, the high life was not all it was cracked up to be. If you use the example of F. Scott Fitzgerald's Great Gatsby, The Great Gatsby, which was written around that time, it was somewhat autobiographical for him, but just as in the book, his life kind of fizzled out at the end there. Two things didn't go so well. Here's another few major events of the first years of the 1920s. In April of 1920, immigrant businessmen Sacco and Vanzetti were charged with a violent theft of a payroll of a shoe factory in New York, even though by the end of the trial most people thought that those two fellows weren't guilty of what had happened, they were still convicted of the crime. In September of 1920, the Shoeless Joe trial took place. The Chicago White Sox were accused of throwing the 1919 World Series of baseball. Henry Ford was much in the news. He was a good businessman, but he created controversy when he spoke quite often. He ran unsuccessfully for senator. In June of 1924, the 10 millionth car rolled off the Ford assembly line. It had taken him seven years to make his first one million cars and only 132 days to make the next 10 million. Radio broadcasts of news, sermons, and music began daily in New York City in March of 1922. In May of that year, labor racketeering made its first appearance in Chicago. There was much violent labor action and striking. And at the end of that year, Lord Carnivon and Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in Egypt. The year 1923 brought marathon dancing and Jack Dempsey boxing matches. The Teapot Dome trials began in October of that year. They resulted in corruption convictions for some who were close to President Harding. They related to oil uh, grant being granted supposedly for the military but uh, certain people conveniently got contracts uh, for big money there, so that some of the oil spilled on Captain, uh, and President Harding in the process. In 1924, Nikolai Lenin died in Russia, and Clarence Darrow defended Leopold and Loeb in their murder of, uh, the murder of Bobby Franks. In the summer of 1924, William McAdoo, who was the former Secretary of the Treasury under President Wilson and was Wilson's son-in-law, and Alfred E. Smith, the governor of New York, faced off for nomination as Democratic presidential candidate. 
one of the major topics of the, the debate, and Smith was promoting that, was whether the party should officially condemn the actions of the Ku Klux Klan. They did decide not to do that. In 1925, the year began with Floyd Collins getting caught in a cave in Cave City, Kentucky. For two weeks, the nation followed the rescue attempts to free Collins from the tight space in which he had become trapped in the newspaper, and I'm pretty sure probably on the radio too. For many days, he continued to communicate with rescue teams, but when they finally reached him, unfortunately, they found him dead and they just buried him right in the, in the cave. In July, the Scopes monkey trial began, and this time it was uh, as attorney extraordinary Darrow was defending a teacher who dared to teach Darwin's theory of evolution in a Tennessee classroom. It had been recently been made against the law there to do so. Darwin made expert witness and former presidential candidate William Jennings Bryan look silly on the stand as he defended the Bible view, biblical view on evolution. Bryan died soon after, perhaps as a result of testifying in the hot Tennessee sun. In October of 1925, everyone was flocking to Miami, Florida and building retirement communities, and some of our people got caught up in that too. Uh, this was about the same time now that the events of the Michigan Read Book Arc of Justice took place. Through all of the many things that were happening in the 1920s, one topic seems to recur, and that's the Ku Klux Klan. You know the Klan. I thought I did too. White men in white robes and hoods and torches burning crosses and with sinister agendas trying to keep the th way things, things the way they had always been, with the white men holding all the cards and the land and the money and so on. The first Klan happened after the Civil War, and <coughs> it was evil and violent. There was another clan in the 1960s, which was also scary, and the Black Panther movement came along to counter that on the other side. But the second clan was different. It was also probably wrong-headed like the others had been, but it was there for slightly different reasons than just racial hatred. It started as a reaction to the 1915 D.W. Griffith film, The Birth of a Nation. There's a copy of that ad from the movie when it first came out in 1915 over there on the side if you get a chance later to look at that. The movie was blatantly based on a series of white supremacist novels by Thomas Dixon. William Simmons wanted to glorify those times, and he set out to, with his help, to openly recruit Klansmen right in the lobbies of the theaters. The film did make the rounds again in 1924, and that brought on another surge of interest in the KKK. While the second Klan had it in for <coughs> blacks, to some degree, it was really more focused on religious differences, I was surprised to learn. The major enemies were Roman Catholics and, to a lesser degree, Jewish people, especially in smaller towns. And now you can begin to see how it held some interest here in Chippewa County, especially in out county areas, because many of the settlers here were Scottish or Irish Protestants. They came through Canada briefly, but uh, they settled here in the late 19th century. A lot of them already belonged to the Orange Lodges that were in existence in the area here, and it promoted the interests of Protestants. Orange was particularly the color of Protestant interests in Ireland and Scotland. If you remember that song, my mother, she was orange and my father, he was green or something like that. I think being the same way around. <laughs> so before we talk about what was going on in Chippewa County at this time though, I do want to talk about a couple pieces of legislation that were making the rounds. I think they had a lot to do with shaping the psyche. And uh, also explained why a lot of black people came north to Detroit at that time to work in the auto and steel industries and the appliance industries and that ratcheted <coughs> up the tensions in places like Detroit. The Immigration Act of 1924, also known as the Johnson-Reed Act, was enacted May 26, 1924 by President Calvin Coolidge. This federal law limited the annual number of immigrants that could come to, from any country to 2% of the number of people from that country that were already living in the United States in 1890, so that's very confusing. That was a 1% drop from the Immigration Restriction Act of 1921. What it meant essentially was that there were a lot less people coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, from the Middle East, East Asia, and India. And one of the bill's sponsors said he believed these people were arriving sick and starving, so they weren't contributing to the American economy and were less able to adapt to American culture. The seemingly blatant racism of this appalls me a little bit, but beyond that, it was the immigrants who were likely to fill those entry-level jobs in the factories and service jobs. It wasn't until 1965, in fact, that the immigration laws were loosened, and even now some harken back to the good old days of those restrictive laws. Now, there seemed to be anecdotal evidence for that 1924 bill. 
Craig Fox in his book, which I recommend highly, I think the library's got this now, Everyday Klansfolk, White Protestant Life in the KKK in 1920s Michigan, quotes an observer of the time, Kenneth Blass. He was a Klansman himself and he was a postal worker from Nuego and he kept a journal of goings on around that time. He complained about how there were, quote, good and bad immigrants. How many Germans, he said, German towns, Scotch towns, English towns, or Swede towns did you ever hear of in Detroit or any other city, he asked. The first generation born here was immediately absorbed, mainly because they were human tolerant, white Protestant, Gentile people. Regardless of who was coming and why, there were less immigrants in the 1920s, and the word went out in the South that there were good paying, entry level jobs to be had up north in Michigan. Black people came in large numbers. Detroit's population more than doubled between 1910 and 1921 to more than 1 million and 35, at least 35,000 of those were blacks. This created fiction between them and more recent immigrants, as well as the whites, who now found themselves in perceived competition to move up in the ranks. Whites wanted to contain the blacks in the same crime-ridden, disease-ridden districts to which they had already to, already to a large degree cordoned off most of those recent immigrants. Black people understandably, want, understandably wanted out of a bad situation. The other day I heard a quote by soon-to-be-retired Massachusetts Representative Barney Frank, and he was answering a question about gay marriage. The interviewer wondered why nobody would heard about it much until recently, and he said, in essence, that when an oppressed group accepts the status quo, you never hear about it. But when they start to do something about it, that's when it becomes visible and people start paying attention. So that was why when black people started demanding an, an equal chance to live somewhere safe in Detroit, that things started to get out of hand. Ironically, many of the things the blacks were demanding were also things that would have benefited a lot of poor whites and immigrants. And why didn't they stand up for the rights of those blacks, black people? Studs Terkel took up the issue in his 1992 book, Race, how blacks and whites think and feel about the national obsession. In an interview, psychologist Dr. Kenneth B. Clark, former president of the American Psychological Association, had much to say. He had been an expert witness in the Supreme Court's 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education decision. Clark noted that even though it would seem logical that poor whites and people of other ethnicities would have more in common with poor blacks, in case after case, they sided with the more affluent white people. They aspired to be a member of this group, and when it became apparent that they had more of a chance to be accepted than these uh, poor black folks did, those who appeared different, the poor white and brown and olive skin people would, ident would dis distance themselves from the poor blacks. Indeed, in today's society, it appears we've created two classes or more of blacks, those who, quote, made it and those who didn't. And are the affluent blacks these days doing any more to help those people who are struggling than people of other backgrounds? Clark made a case for classism more than racism. He also said that before blacks came on the scene, the various ethnic groups were being picked on by the whites, but once there were blacks, the ethnic groups lost no time in getting together to criticize the blacks. There's a strange psychology at work here, that bullying another one would make one feel better about being bullied oneself, but he notes the importance in the American psyche of always having someone who's worse off than you. A lot of the immigrants that the new law was aimed at were also from heavily Catholic regions. Catholicism <coughs> appeared to have a lot of ritual and mysticism. There was a guy in a white robe across the ocean who made decisions for everyone else. Ironically, the KKK doesn't seem to have noticed the parallels between what they were setting up themselves and what they were complaining about. Also, Catholics often had parochial schools to send their children to. Some Protestant factions viewed this as undermining the public school system and what they wanted taught. Also, they were against the theory of evolution, which is a battle still being fought today. There were two other bills then that some Protestants were trying to push through. One was making public school a requirement through grade eight, and the other one made it illegal to teach anything other than the biblical theory of evolution. These did not succeed on a federal level. They came close sometimes, but there were a lot of states that did approve those things, just like we did with and the women's right to vote before everybody else. By the mid-1920s, there was another man, Hiram W. Evans of Texas, who was in charge of the Klan, and he hired an advertising machine, and that distributed all sorts of uh, paraphernalia, Klan hats, Klan toys, Klan books, and Klan furniture, so it was becoming a real business. He also, in good pyramid scheme fashion, allowed some of the membership fees to go to the people who enrolled the new members. 
And this organization then went to work with thousands of recruiters. They found out and visited all the small towns, including in Michigan. They had their fingers on the pulse and the mood of those small towns and had the ability to adapt the messages they went. This new clan started advocating whoops, <laughs> for things of concern to farmers and other rural folk, including public school and religious education, which we talked about. I'm reminded of one of my favorite comedy routines of all time by the Canadian troupe The Frantics, in which a fundamentalist is enduring other creation stories being told in a grade school class, including Hindu and Native American, while waiting impatiently for the Bible's version to be told. He grumbles, I didn't want all religions taught, I wanted our religion taught. While he has been poo-pooing the other stories, when his is finally told, it too has elements of the fantastic by comparison to the ones that have preceded. And he slowly realizes this, his voice trails off, and a small voice at the back of the room pipes up, I believe you, and he says, oh, be quiet. And that's the end of the routine. <laughs> that brings us to another point, though. Many rural, less educated, salt-of-the-earth types took that Bible very literally, you know, and they resented some fellow off in Rome who was telling people what they could and couldn't do. So while the Catholics had their Knights of Columbus and religious societies, the Ku Klux Klan, became a lobbying and rallying group for small town Protestant interests. Leonard Moore called the Klan an interest group for the average white Protestant in the interest of instrument of reform. Perhaps sensing, sensing where it would make the greatest impact, the new Klan was centered in Indiana, right in mid, the Midwest here. Calaverns began to spring up in all the little towns in the Midwest. And I wanted to get a graphic here. I'll see if I can do it though. We wanted to show you a map that showed uh, most of the uh, uh, most of Michigan had clans, and the way they knew this, there was a uh, they found a whole bunch of records for 1993 in Nuevo County uh, that had uh, information about the clans in Michigan, especially in Nuevo County. Good, there we go. Uh, any place that there was evidence in the notes of where there was a clan up on the map there, so you can see that most of our counties, even in Upper Michigan, there was a chapter of the clan at that time. So, the conservative estimate was that there were 80,000 Klan members in Michigan at this time. Crosses were openly burned and many sharp words were exchanged in print, perhaps in town squares and in corner stores. But at least in Michigan, there wasn't a whole lot of violence at this time. And that was until an act that happened in the fall of 1926 that appalled a lot of people and it was one of two things that caused the membership of the Klan to drop off. But we're going to talk about that in a little bit. There were also rallies. I kind of think these were also more open than they were during the first incarnation of the Klan. They had daylight marches. And there's a photograph, I've got the article over here on the side as well, of a thing that I didn't know how to make sense of for sure. The September 5th, 1924 evening news had a picture on the front page of Klansmen in their full regalia, hoods and everything, presenting a wreath to a Jewish businessman on the 50th anniversary of his business. It wasn't black that I could see, but I did find the whole thing a little bit creepy and disturbing. In Chippewa County, we do have an article about a Klan gathering of 2,000 people in Pickford on July 25th, 1925. We also know, thanks to Jim Dwyer again, of a rally in Newbury on July 31st, 1925. It didn't seem like it was so well received there, though. Someone did burn a cross in the Sioux on October 20th, 1924, which was the same day there was a gospel choir from Jackson, Michigan here, although that one might have been a coincidence. Also, good evidence here is the uh, sheriff's election in Chippewa County in 1924. And uh, th there were 13 candidates. You can turn them on if you want, that's okay. There were 13 candidates on the Republican side in the primary. They included James Douglas, a Protestant, and Charles Ahern, who was a Catholic. Ahern won the primary for the election. But just before the election, there was a letter in the paper from attorney Frank Warner on October 27, 1924. He was complaining of the write-in effort that was going on for Douglas. He was overtaking the nominated uh, candidate. He said there should only be one GOP candidate, the one who was selected by the official process. Well, the election played itself out, and it turned out uh, rural districts like Pickford ended up overwhelmingly electing Douglas over her in that year. And I don't know if his actions reflected more. You know, there, I know there was a lot of ac action going on with uh, shutting down various places that were probably still selling booze behind the scenes and everything. They were like cracked down on the saloon, saloons and the water and holes and stuff, even though they were supposed to be selling booze at that time. That may or may not have changed if uh, Ahern had been in charge instead of Douglas. There was certainly awareness of the Klan right through that whole period. Um, Librarian Amber Clement just found me an article this week 
about the Spanish flu epidemic, uh, epidemic of 1918. And it was interesting for many reasons, including that the reporters said before people realized the seriousness of the situation, the, the seriousness of the situation in town, they were joking that the masked attendants looked like they were either ready for Halloween, it was October when this happened, or like members of the KKK. So, you know, people were still thinking about that in 1918. One other information, bit of information Jim Dwyer just supplied me with here was uh, also, oh, I know this was the business about the Sioux Times. It had stuck in the back of my mind that this was the case and I had not actually found the story. But the Sioux Times, which had been around since 1898 as sort of an alternative to the evening news, which was all pulled together and in its present form from 1903 on, that paper was bought out in April of 1924 by Ku Klux Klan interests. And after that, they were going to be known as the Cloverland Telegram. There was an article in the paper that said they were a weekly right now, but they figured the money was just going to flow right in there and they were going to have that thing be a daily paper pretty soon. Well, it didn't work out quite the way they had wished when the employees of the paper mounted a legal action for unpaid wages. The paper folded in December of 1924, so that was the end of the Sioux Times and of the Klan's official organ in Chippewa County here. But there was also a small item I found from October of 1925 talking <coughs> about a barber who was suing a black man for the dollar he owed for a haircut. More interesting to me than the fact that he owed that dollar was the fact that the black man, Clifford Thornton, said he didn't usually go to the downtown barber shops because he was afraid it would hurt their business, quote unquote, that was his quote. But instead he went to shops in the West End out in Algonquin because he figured there were more fair foreigners who had their hair cut out there so he wouldn't raise as much of a, of a problem. So it just surprised me to know that maybe, you know, people did consider uh, that, that, you know, if a black person got their hair cut there, I wouldn't go there. I can't believe, however, under those same circumstances, um, as I say, we wouldn't have problems here of some sort. I did talk to Pete Guyanicure, one of our longtime business people and uh, citizens here, and he got thinking about it, and he knew of a couple of examples among his uh, fellow restaurateurs and uh, barkeepers who uh, they would serve black patrons. This was in more recent years, but they then smashed the glasses afterwards so they couldn't be used again for anybody else. And probably as armed forces, and we're here more, you know, and when they've got the Air Force Base and everything, more things like that happened. But, I, you know, nothing really horribly blatant, I guess. So, um, I did want to talk a little bit about what happened to the second KKK that made them unravel so fast in 1926, or 27. There were a uh, great many of them in a big hurry that joined the Klan because it served their purposes, but the numbers dropped off just as fast. That Craig Fox, who I mentioned, that wrote that book about Klan in Michigan, based his studies on records for Nuevo County, as I told you. They found a bunch of records for the KKK in the wall of a farmer's house in 1993. Some of them went up on the, the internet as curiosities were auctioned very fast, but Central Michigan University got a hold of them, a lot of the records. And what he found in his study indicated that that membership was very mainstream. Many people of any, many walks of life in rural areas joined the Klan. But in May of 1926, in the little community of Three Lakes, north of Muskegon, three people lost their lives. There was a couple about to be married, and the girl's father who ran a tavern and hotel there. The couple was just about to go to town to get their marriage license, but a box came, and they thought, gee, uh, maybe it's a wedding present for us. So they stayed and waited while their dad opened the box, and unfortunately it didn't came to contain a wedding present that contained a bomb. And they didn't all die at once, but as a result of that bomb, all three of those people died. And uh, the father, August Krubach, was a Roman Catholic and he was bitterly opposed to the Ku Klux Klan, that was well known, but he had um, just beat a gentleman named Asa Bartlett in a political contest. And this Asa Bartlett, who quickly admitted that he was the bomber, was high up in, it was rumored that he was high up in the Klan organization. And uh, he denied it, but there was someone even higher up there who denied it as well. Anyway, the damage had been done and that pretty well killed uh, the KKK in Michigan after that act of violence. There was also something that happened in Indiana. There was a well-publicized rape trial. Uh, there was a girl who poisoned herself, but not before she had accused KKK Grand Dragon for Indiana, David Curtis Stevenson, of having raped her. There was um, a radical splinter group of this that did carry on in Michigan called the Black Legion in the 1930s, and they did a lot of violence down in the Detroit area. But most of the people dropped out of the Klan at that point because it had been corrupt and it no longer served their needs. I don't believe that there was ever out-and-out -out warfare between classes or religions in the Sioux. 
1923, the community came together. They built War Memorial Hospital, which we'll be looking at in a minute here. And um, that was the last and best of a series of hospitals here. Some were private hospitals, a few were public, but uh, nothing lasted and was as great as the War Memorial over here. And at the end of 1923 and early 1924, we also built the Amonason home on the hill here for orphan children, and we supported that until 1970s. As a whole, this was a community that looked out for the least among us. But there may have been an undercurrent of resentment that occasionally came out in a passive-aggressive way. There were persistent rumors that several Catholic churches in the out county areas had been burned down by non-Catholic factions, whether they had or not. In April of 1925, there was a letter from uh, after the Brimley Church had been burned by a Cary Street resident who signed his name but then also said he was a Klansman. He stated that he didn't hate Catholics and he knew that some of the Klansmen he knew had helped to fight that fire out in Brimley. These may be things that are best left to molder in the dust of time rather than to dredge them up again and have the resentment and uncertainty grow. The Marquette Mining Journal, relating to the news of the Klan purchase of the Sioux Times in 1924, made what I consider a very good point. I'd like to believe this is true. Made it very well. The people of the, United, of the Upper Peninsula are from very different races and backgrounds, and they've managed to live side by side and help each other out for a very long time. The paper said they had to do it, or life up here, as harsh as it is, would be next to impo impossible. I've been working over the past few years to try to construct a thorough picture of Sault Ste. Marie from industrial times through the present, and it's not escaped my notice, uh, my notice that a lot of our prominent early citizens were Quakers. Judge Steer and Michael McGee, who was uh, the president of uh, First National Bank for a long time and a big birder, possibly as well the Chandlers and the Meads leaned that way. Chase Osborne was also quite forward thinking when it came to differences in race, class, and religion. Maybe if the memory of them lives on in the framework of our community, we could avert some of the troubles that have plagued the bigger cities like Detroit. Now, one battle that uh, Darrow and his ilk didn't win was to keep covenants out of real estate titles that allowed control of who could and could not move into certain neighborhoods, and this later did become uh, a matter in the housing in Detroit. There's certain cities like Detroit that are still very segregated. We had our neighborhoods in town here, like Little Italy below the hill and the French district east of the Power Canal, and they were sort of populated by certain ethnic groups, but I don't think they were ever partic particularly restrictive, and I think pretty much anybody who wanted to live one place or the other in town would have been able to if their finances would have permitted. I also feel proud, being in this town, that despite all the devices that connect us to more like-minded folks around the country, you can pretty much ignore anybody who doesn't agree with you these days, that uh, we are more inclined to visit with the people who live on our street and get to know them, socialize with them on the front porches, and the kids still play together in the backyards. That's something that I think a lot of people appreciate in you know, the small town attitude here. A lot of the uh, income of most of the Sioux residents in town is fairly homogeneous too, though, considering the housing, the housing business. So there is no big margin of difference. We have a very few people who are wealthy and can afford something bigger and better. But um, hopefully, uh, as long as we do like we do in this town and try to get to know each other. Uh, the sad tale of Dr. Sweet in the book and his family won't happen to us here. Hopefully we can regard that as an instructive fable and avoid it. Okay, let's talk for a minute specifically about what was happening in Chippewa County from the early to the mid-1920s. We talked about prohibition earlier. That was a big deal in the paper every day, I think pretty much every place, but here too. There were a lot of people who were making moonshine in the basement or in the backwoods, and a lot more were still finding ways to get a hold of it. Uh, more troubling, I think some people were getting sick and dying from the desperate need for alcohol and drinking anything that had alcohol in it, whether it was safe or not. I personally regret that uh, the Sault Ste. Marie, which did have a lot to do, I mean, uh, we had a brewery and we had a lot of saloons in town. They were places people came when they got out of the woods after they were prospecting or the fur trade or whatever, they'd come back here and have a two and enjoy uh, some, some fun. So I, was, I regret that we didn't have that for 10 years here. There must have been some alcohol being sneaked across our long border during that time from Drummond Island to Whitefish Point. Nobody talks much about it, but I'm sure that must have happened. Uh, border patrol and Coast Guard any time they were in the paper said they had a handle on it and it wasn't that bad. An article in the July 21st, 1924 Evening News said though that smuggling of illegal aliens into the United States was also a big deal because of that immigration law. And as people were coming here on education visas and finding ways never to go back again, things like that. So, 
We didn't have very many brushes with the mob here. Remember, we talked about the mob stuff going on. But notable is uh, John Hamilton, who was a lieutenant of John Dillinger down in Chicago in Indiana, coming here to visit his sister out in Algonquin on one night in April of 1934. She put him up for a night, and that earned her a prison sentence of, I think, three months in 1935. Now, and what surprised me most about Dr. Sweet, as I was reading through the paper, there wasn't a single word in the evening news that I could find about what was going on with that trial, even though there was lots of coverage of the Scopes Monkey trial and uh, Clarence Darrow, which had happened just months before that uh, trial that's talked about in the book here. Lots of people here admired William Jennings Bryan, who was a uh, chief witness in that Scopes trial. And when he died shortly afterward, uh, that was in the paper too. There was lots of stuff about Darrow, but I found it strange that there wasn't any talk much about his next trial. So some of the things that were uh, coming in the 1920s, right around the time we're talking about mid-1920s, this building out here where Callahan's and Gilhooley's was, it's now a doctor's office, that was just being built at that time. Out of Falls History of Sault Ste. Marie, if you've read that, uh, was published posthumously about then. A bunch of the other authors like Stanley Newton got together to uh, get that published after his death. Edison Sioux had just moved into what is now the Chippewa County Historical Society building, and they had down in the north end of Ashland here, and they had an open house and let everybody come in and see what they had done to the building. The International Ferry across the St. Mary's River from Sioux, Ontario, started running into a new dock, which was the uh, Coast Guard dock, where the Coast Guard base is right now. And this is what I view as one of the more tragic stories I'd like to kind of look into this, this as I do things. Uh, the old Cracknell House at 331 Lyon Street back here burned to the ground on August 25th of 1925. Cracknell had been an up-and-coming businessman and he built his wife a really pretty mansion over here on what would be the Power Canal. I guess it, would, it was at that time. He died in 1910 an untimely death, he was quite young. And Mrs. Cracknell never occupied that house again. It was widely known as the haunted house. And she had implored people to keep the staircase, the tower in the stair room with the staircase in it, but there was no way to save the house. So if we can get this machine to work again, look, let's look at a few photos of what was going on at that time. At least it's still up on the screen. So this is first, do you remember that? Yeah. Up on the hill, built that in 1923, 24. That was up there into the 70s, where about where Pizza Hut is now. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the several photos from the time. I think it's I think it was where Pizza Hut is, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 13th or 14th out there someplace. Kind of tucked back farther down. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to believe. You get up there now and it looks so different. All right. We're going to keep moving along here. The emanation of the world. Because they should make people do this with their drink in here. So <laughs> steady. That's hard to tell with the button. There we go. Okay, this is um, Portage Avenue, right around that time, 1926. Wish I'd pulled up that piece of paper. We may be guessing here on some of these. Um, you can see St. Mary's, the steeple of St. Mary's there. Here's Ashland Street right here. Ashland's going that way, there's Portage. This is the no, east okay. east portage and west portage. The man store. Uh, yeah, yeah street stole the business contract at that time. I'm not sure what that was. That's the at the corner there. That building is pretty tall. It's just a parking lot, or it's just like yeah. empty now. I, uh, I wonder what that building looks yes. like. Well, I think that was uh, First National Bank, yeah. wasn't it, yeah. on that corner? Yeah. yeah. And Sue Savings was three stories high until that fire in 1983 on the other corner there. So. Well, the Sioux Hardware was in the too. Right, yeah, they were that way, I think. Right. So, the, the other thing. corner, coming this way. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of things different. So a lot of buildings are still there, though, too. You know, you look at some of those facades, they're still down there. Yeah. So this one isn't, I don't think that's gone. With the tower on it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, the theory is that I should just be able to click along here. There we go. Okay, there's a parade, circus parade in 1926, also on Portage. You can see the courthouse in the background. And then um, old Ferguson House, which is still there. Otherwise, pretty much all different now. This is down where, um, this next to where the corner store is. That's next to where that little automotive place is where we're at right now. Well, had to be taken in front of the post office. Yep, it was. Right in front of the federal building, there's the mailbox. <laughs> So let's uh, see what else we got here. Whoops, I that's lost a back there. Yeah, I think that's that? um, one on the right, isn't it? Sims? There was on the at one point. On the left there, that oh, okay. was the garage of the livery 
loft up above, we used to play ball up there wow. on rainy days. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They keep clicking on that. You're close. Right? I know. You can see my little markers. There we go. Now, see, I thought that was the Pirates hockey team from 1925. It turned out it was 1935. But there was a Pirates hockey team back then. They were playing at, um, the puller wasn't there then, so they were. At the old um, at Cades, it says. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was just going to think the Ridge Street rank had burned down by that time, so it was, uh, yeah. it was Cades or that. Yeah. It does look like it. It's all sitting around Taffy Abel. Yeah. 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 In the back row, yeah. yeah. Ernie Bakari. Ernie Bakari. Yeah. 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 A couple of the Bambacos probably from across the river. If not, they were. We used to go back and forth a lot more in those days. Oh, there's, uh, there we go. That is um, J.C. Penny and Passmore's, which now is the back door. And uh, let's see, this building's gone, unfortunately. But that one's still there. That was the end of the block. Mm -hmm. and that, so that was one of the big towns. Passmore and Packwood was a shoe store for a lot of years. Let's see, whoops, they're both the same again. And there is the yeah. potato popcorn wagon. People used to tell me about that down in the corner of, um, I think that was the corner of Ridge and it says Spruce at Ashford. Yeah. 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 You sold, you sold yeah. kernels yeah. for a penny. <laughs> 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 I, could, I could get your popcorn before you went into the theater. That wasn't um, well, too far, I guess, from where the Colonial Theater was pretty soon after that. So mm -hmm. the, temple was the, the temple was... Well, the was the that was the other popcorn wagon. That was down farther. Wasn't somebody else to, on Ridge and... Ashman? There was another guy yeah, with The temple was between Spruce and Thorridge. Right. Mm -hmm. But Colonial was down on Thorridge. Right. Now the, the Colonial was on Ashman. It was in the 300 block, I think. Was it? Yeah, briefly. It wasn't open very long. Jacob Andory owned it. But there was another popcorn wagon on the corner of Ridge and the Ashman, I think, that somebody had for a while there. And I know people used to do right. that for yeah. the temple theater. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else have we got? Pictures of Homecoming, 1923. Wasn't. Uh, it was a little bit before that, but our big homecoming celebration <coughs> happened in 1923. This is some of the floats and some of the big events. And I think I put in a picture of the actual um, ceremony down there. Let's see. Of the, there's some more pictures. And that's the business district a little bit later. There's uh, Ashman. Not too horribly changed, I guess. There's the hub. There's the sky scratcher. And the, um, Masonic building, and this is gone, unfortunately. Collins is gone. And this big building here, I guess, is gone. Was that Kresge's before Collins? Uh, Woolworth's, I think, was next to it. Oh, Woolworth's. Yeah, Woolworth's was in here. And I didn't realize that they had torn this building down after. This was supposed to be one of the biggest buildings, too. They tore that down to build the gas station that Richwood ended up in eventually. But, and this is the building that Kresge's was in right here, eventually. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Newton Block. All right. Whoops. <laughs> I think I skipped something. Probably because you're right and left arrow D. Yep. That's hard to see in the No, I mean the actual arrows on the computer. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I wanted to show you that. Oh. And there, yep, from the other direction. That's the 500 block. The King's Shoe Store, which I was just looking at something the other day. Uh, what else is there? The, both of those have changed, obviously. That's where the Community Action Agency is. But that one's gone. Damn it. S. A. Mark's clothing. They were in the, the building where Woolworths was before the Masonic building, and they moved. So, and the streetcar tracks again. Oh, oh, <laughs> and there's that building I was just telling you about. I think the big. It was called the Masters. Wayland Masters building was named for a pastor who built it. Who said this is next to the Rexall drugstore? Uh, where? Uh, to the left of the uh, Rexall sign. Or is that all one sign for the drugstore? Um, I don't even see that. It's a shoe store. store. Yeah, there's the Kinney Shoes, that's the Kinney Shoe Store. Oh, okay. And then S.A. Marks building. I always wondered if the Marks were any relation to the um, people that came up with the dry cleaning process. Some of them are still around here. That was a Marks family, too. But, mm. All right, and I need mm. the other arrow. And we'll go back to the thing that I just skipped over. I don't know if you're going to recognize anybody in this picture or not. <laughs> this was the uh, class of 1925, having their dress up. They dress one up in costumes, Bert Flood. Hmm. 
Did I have to give a pull away? Can you tell there was one of the Marxists? Must have been some relation to them. I think we've got a couple of uh, a couple others. There's some more pictures of sure Jerry Lynch, the lumber guy, yeah. one of the McNaughtons. Mm -hmm. I think I had more fun in those days. I don't know. <laughs> well, and then we're back to our map again. So that's kind of the end of that. I was hoping I had a picture of, uh, oh, there's the hospital. I missed the hospital when the shuffle there. That was the first War Memorial Hospital. That part of the building isn't there anymore. The addition, but the oldest part of the hospital now is an addition that was built in the 1930s. But uh, this was the very first part of the hospital built in 1924. The first hospital the was on the corner of Vail. Uh, there was one there, and then there was one before that on the, in the 700 block of Cedar. And there was one down here on uh, Dawson Street that was for a while too. So, and then there were also a bunch of marine hospitals. So, um, but this was the one after that one on Bingham. The one on Bingham for a long time, and then this was this was the one right after that. So, I think that's it. Um, so, I just wanted to sum up by saying there's always a few intolerant people in the world. By and large, though, Chippewa County has always been a place where there's room for everyone and for their individual ways of doing things, and I hope that's always going to be the case. I will open the floor to comments or questions if anybody wants to ask me. Thank you.